This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with creativity speaker Jason Kotecki. We talk about adultitis and the cures to it, how to get a literary agent and a book publisher, and the power of authenticity. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Jason Kotecki. Jason is an artist, author, and speaker who considers himself a professional reminderer and permission granter. His mission is to demonstrate how the secrets of childhood are timeless, and through his work, he shares real-world strategies and practical ideas for driving innovation, preventing burnout, and achieving new levels of productivity. He is the co-founder of Escape Adulthood, which seeks to help people escape from adulthood and annihilate adultitis. We're going to find out what adultitis actually is. So welcome to the show, Jason. Hi, James. How's it going? Very well. Very well. Thank you. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, let's see. Right now, we are uh, we are about a month into our newest project, which is called the Escape Adulthood Adventure Club. And basically, uh, every month, we're going to be uh, releasing four creative challenges for people to do. And if they post their uh, uh, shenanigans online, we send them free uh, stickers that are sort of like merit badges that I design. Um, they're just kind of a real fun uh it's a fun little project, just trying to get the word out more about escape adulthood and to give people ideas of how to fight this terrible thing called adultitis, which I know we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so I've been working on that, and then I've got some new uh, new products coming out. We have a new calendar that's coming out and a new greeting card line featuring some of my art. So, uh, And then, of course, fall is, is one of my busy speaking uh, time. So that's that's going to start ramping up here pretty quick. So keeping busy, but uh, just trying to have fun while we do it. Fantastic. And how did you get started uh, as an artist? First of all, obviously, you, you're known now as being an author and a speaker. But wh- where did the art part come in? Where did, where did it all start for you? Oh, that that's that's my first love, James. Uh, I, it's, it's like the old cliche, like as soon as I could pick up a crayon. I mean, I, that's the first thing I, I was told I was good at. It's the first thing I loved doing. Uh, that was the one thing I always knew I wanted to do something with was art. So uh, that's taken a lot of twists and turns along the way. But from the very beginning, that's been uh, something I have loved to do. So there's a lot of people that have that as a as a, you know, a hobby. But how did you go from making it into a hobby to make it into something that you, you did professionally? Well, um, I went to school for illustration and uh, I learned pretty early on after about a year, I realized I was not very employable. Um, and so even though freelancing, you're working for yourself, s- still the art directors and stuff are still telling you what to do. And I just I just didn't like that. So one of the things I, I kind of had as a hobby that I uh, pursued a little bit more was a comic strip about childhood. And it was called Kim and Jason. It was based loosely off my uh, wife and I um, when we were little. We didn't know each other when we were little, but we had this childlike spirit that attracted us to one another. And so it was this comic strip about childhood. And I tried for about six years. I published it online. I was in a few small newspapers and it just never took off the way that I hoped it would. And so I I actually kind of uh, put art on the shelf for a while. At that point, my my speaking and the the writing was starting to take off a little bit more. And I kind of told this story in my head that I could never make money with my art. So that just had to be a side thing. Um, And I probably went three years without really making much of anything. I was still creative in my business. But as far as making art, it was just not not at the forefront. But eventually it just it just kind of bubbled up and I I just sort of had to. Um, And finally, I gave myself permission to start making art again without any preconceived notion of trying to make money or um, who it would be for. It was just for me. And slowly, a new style emerged and my voice started to um, emerge. And uh, I started making making this, this new art. And I would say probably the last three or four years has been slowly working it into the forefront of everything that I do. And um, it's sort of where the, the book deal I got a couple years ago came from was just from from putting out art sharing it online 
and uh, I was doing a speech for a local technology company, and they posted some of my art online as a uh, promotion for the speech, and a book agent who was a friend of a friend of this person happened to see it, and she followed uh, to my website and saw that I had done some self-published stuff. And so she basically called and said, please, can we meet? I would love to represent you. Are you interested at all in any sort of traditional publishing? And, and, uh, that kind of, that kind of started the ball rolling in that direction. So you'd actually started the process of, of, of self-publishing first. I know when you sp- I speak to a lot of authors and they, they have this question like, should I self-publish or if I self-publish then is that going to put other public, you know, big publishers off if I try and finally get a, a, you know, a book publishing deal? W- what advice do you generally give when, when you're having conversations with authors about that, that publishing process? Yeah, I think they're both great. They're, you just have to realize they're, they're different. So if you really want to make money, you should self-publish because that is the best way to make money. Um, For a long time, I was convinced that's all I would ever do because uh, I would sell books to our uh, audience and to uh, speaking at speaking engagements and things like that. Um, uh, Traditional publisher is still a a little bit uh, more useful for, I'd say, credibility and they're really good on distribution. It's really hard to get your books into bricks and mortar stores and things like that as easily. You still can, but it's just easier because they have those channels. Um, but I will say that as far as uh, putting it off, I mean, the the reality is that a, a book publisher wants you when you already can prove that you can sell books. And so that was one of the reasons that they um, – wanted to work with us is because we had already had a track record of selling a lot of books that we had published to our people. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that we had a a pretty decent uh, following and that we had a good track record on selling books was, I think, a big factor of why they were interested in working with me. So so you'd I don't develop, know that, that you'd kind of develop that plat your your platform before you, you even came to you know having being approached or approaching a, a large publisher. Exactly, and I think that's kind of a misconception people have is that if you get um, a publisher, that they'll, they'll do all the work for you, and that's just not that's not the case. You still have to hustle and sell and and uh, put everything you have behind the selling and the market. I mean, the the writing the book is is the easy fun part, but it's the the selling is the hard part. And, um, you know, that's, that's the, I think the fallacy most people have is like, well, I I don't want to sell the book. I just want to write the book. And, you know, that's great. But then once it comes out, it's just going to sit there because unless you're, you know, Stephen King or a former president of the United States or someone like that, um, they they just don't have the resources to put a lot of effort into um, every single book that comes out. So they're really looking for someone who's going to put a lot of effort in themselves. And which is a which is a reason why self publishing is so great because if you're going to put all that money into it, then then you'll get more of a reward because you get more of the profits. And I mentioned at the top of the show your your mission is to annihilate adultitis. So what is adultitis? Well, adultitis is a is a disease, uh, an epidemic that my wife and I um, uh, named probably about ten year, over ten years ago now. That is basically a disease that happens when you forget what it was like to be a kid. So there's, uh, you know, you, any adults you see walking around that are in any sort of a mild depression, stressed out, uh, in some extreme cases, the inability to smile. Um, it's just it's just that sort of grumpy, non joyful existence. And I was interviewing uh, Seth Godin. Some some of your people might know he's a marketing guy, and he pointed out to me that the term adultitis means swelling of the adult. And I thought that was brilliant because that's exactly what it is. If you have too much adult in you, that's when you have adultitis, and it basically, um, you know, it just makes you stressed out, overwhelmed. Uh, lose that sort of zest for life and our mission is to try to get rid of it so if you mention like some of the symptoms and like the prognosis for it then what is the what is the cure then for adultitis well i'm not sure that there is a a straight up cure because it's one of those things it's sort of like james like you know if you if you want to lose weight like for me i would love to be able to eat spinach salads for one day or one week and then be able to eat pizza whenever I want for the rest of my life. And it just doesn't work that way. And so adultitis is always sort of coming at us. And so I think the the biggest thing is being aware of it, hanging out with um, people who don't have it, 
um, you know, dreamers, entrepreneurs, uh, world changers, whatever you want to call it, um, is, is a good way. And, you know, being around kids is helpful. It's funny when, when, um, before we had kids, I was, I was speaking and I was talking about adultitis and people would come up to me afterwards and I said, Oh my gosh, you don't have kids yet. Well, wait till you have kids. Then you'll find that they are the cause of adultitis. And I was sort of freaking out a little bit, but then I would have other people that came up and said, Oh my gosh, you don't have kids. Wait till you have kids. They're so great. They are the cure to adultitis. And so then I realized that adultitis has nothing to do with kids uh, because it is basically all to do with with you and your perception and how you uh, uh, go after things. And I think I, I know people who have adultitis who have no kids. People who have kids have adultitis. Um, it's really about being aware of it. And and I think that's part of it is people people don't realize that it's not a like here's a big distinction I make. It's not about being childish. It's about being childlike. So tapping into those things that we that we knew so well when we were kids, like being curious, asking questions, being passionate, having big dreams, all that sort of thing, uh, being playful, all that stuff, which ties in perfectly to what you talk about with creativity, right? Kids are are born artists. And as uh, Picasso said, the problem is how to remain one as we get older. And so that's pretty much what we try to do is remind people of the stuff that they knew so well when they were kids and bring that back into their adult lives to be able to take their work seriously, but not necessarily take them, themselves too seriously. It's funny, as you're, as you're talking about that, I'm reminded, some, one of uh, one of my listeners yesterday sent me a, a link. It was to an Alan Watts talk, the, uh, the who's a British um, uh, kind of philosopher, mm -hmm. a, a person who lived in, in uh, Mill Valley in California for many years. And he, did, he was talking about how when we talk about when adults talk about life we talk about life as a journey but he said actually that's completely the wrong way to think about it. life isn't a journey life is more like music it's more like play it, you know we, we you know if, if life was like a like a journey you know journey uh, if, if music was along those lines then everyone would just kind of rush to get to the final chord at the end mm -hmm. and that's not what it's about it's, it's about you know enjoying the, the the just the process and, and enjoying the the fun of of music as well there there isn't in some ways there isn't really an end point <laughs> as, yeah. well, as well so you're talking about you know with with kids and i think about you know we had humor cloud on the show before uh the cartoonist and and he talks about this in one of his books about you know, with kids. You watch them at age three or four; they're completely immersed in like with their crayons, like paint, drawing, and painting. And their work is usually very abstract, and and they're just they're just having fun. But they were completely in like a flow state, as you know, psychologists would say. Yeah. And then they go to school. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of conventions and then the peer group has a whole bunch of other conventions. Um, and that's all obviously part of being, you know, going from pre-conventional to conventional, but so many people kind of seem to adults as they kind of go into college and then life don't seem to kind of go to the, this kind of post conventional stage where they essentially understand that all that stuff is useful signposts, but actually that's not really where the, where the joy is as well. So how with many of these adults that you work with, how do you kind of get them to kind of reclaim their crayons and rec reclaim the, the, the childlike nature in them? Well, I think what, what I do is, and I, and I joke about this in, in most of my talks, but it's really true is, and, and you read it at the beginning with the introductions, I'm a professional reminderer and it's sort of a tongue in cheek thing, but it's true because I think, you know, once we get out of school, out of college, university, and, and we're into the real world, quote unquote, and we just get caught up in the day-to-day -day struggle of life, right? Things are just, you know, and, and we get told things, like you said, certain conventions that we kind of follow. And and I just remind people of what they knew when they were kids. What were they passionate about? What were what did they like doing that 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 sort of um, thing? And and through some of the stories I tell about my own kids and my own childhood, I think that brings a sense of nostalgia back that kind of reawakens that. And uh, it's one of those things that in, in, a, in a typical corporate environment or the work world, it's not necessarily um, uh, encouraged. And so I think being able to offer an alternative and that and that as much as I'm a permission or a, a professional reminder I'm also a permission granter and I give people permission to to bring that childlike side out again to ask questions to say hey why why do we have to do it this way um, and I think there's an incredible sense of power in that that really I don't have to do a whole lot other than to reawaken that and then just get out of the way and then I think um, 
and then things start to happen. And then I think this, you know, the community that we've built, the tribe that we've built is, is a great place for people to feel connected and feel like they're not alone because oftentimes they feel like they're sort of on an island, um, whether it's at work or even in their own family. I hear I, people come up to me all the time and say, I married someone with adultitis. And, and it's just, it's a very common thing. So I think being able to open the door for people and, and give them a spark and then provide a community for them to be a part of, I think is two of the most important things that I do for that. And I'm interested because you get, but you do a lot of speaking. We mentioned you're just about to go into a kind of a season of 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 doing kind of speaking at, at different companies and organizations. I'm interested, like when someone first books you, that event organizer, they both, you know, what what are they looking to get for their their the delegates, the people that are coming to that event, and then as you you give that talk and maybe you do workshops as well, I'm also interested to know what happens with the dynamic of coworkers as they go through that so that they, they might start to be seeing something about a coworker that they've never actually seen before. Yeah, that's a good question. So when, when someone hires me, usually it's for like an opening keynote or an ending keynote and they're looking for something, uh, you know, if it's at, if it's at a conference where there's been a lot of heavy, educational content, I'm the guy who comes in and sort of gives the 25,000 foot perspective on it. So um, instead of having them all in the weeds trying to figure out all the details, I remind them of the big picture, why they're doing what they're doing, um, not to take themselves too seriously, just to give them a little bit of permission to just do little things um, to, to move forward, especially at a conference where you're, you're overwhelmed with all this information. Um, and I think one of the things that I do that help people with coworkers is I give them language. Um, so even just adultitis in and of itself is something that then they take back and then they can joke about and they can uh, be serious about too. Of like, oh my gosh, we have too much adultitis here. We need to do something to 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 break it up a little bit. Um, I, I use it's one of my things I think that is is a gift of mine because of the art side is that I'm really good at giving people metaphors for things. So in a way, adultitis is a metaphor for a very complicated series of emotions, thinking of it as like a disease or something. But also, you know, I, I talk about the concept of tinkering, um, which is which is the idea of, you know, just trying little things and seeing if they work rather than being concerned about this big buzzword of innovation of you got to be an innovator. It's like, if you just try things like little kids do, that is a, a much uh, less overwhelming prospect. Right. Um, and you know, so I tell, I tell a story in one of my talks about my daughter who we were going for a walk by the lake and she was wearing this princess dress because that's what little girls do from time to time. And I turned around and I noticed she was up to her armpits in the princess, in the lake, in her princess dress. And I was like freaking out. I'm like, Oh my gosh, what, what, what are you going to ruin your dress? All this stuff. And then I realized like she was living life as well as it could possibly be lived at that moment. And the interesting thing is when we got home, we put the princess dress in the washing machine. It came out good as new. But then what I think about that, I think of how often life gives us that opportunity to jump into something with both feet. And I think how sad is it that we so oftentimes don't take it. We step back. And uh, I, I tell people, I said, we're afraid of getting our princess dress wet, which is our carefully curated version of ourselves that we present to everyone else. It's it's that buzzword that I love and hate at the same time, authenticity. We all want authenticity. We crave authenticity. But people do such a great job of faking authenticity. <laughs> but that's what it is, is that vulnerability of being you, even if it doesn't fit the mold of what people expect. And so people can take that concept of, you know, I had this guy a couple weeks ago, kind of big burly guy. And he was we, we were in the bathroom together afterwards. And he's like, I really liked what you said about that princess dress. I got to get that wet one smile. And it was just so funny <laughs> to hear we're in a men's room talking about this. But I think that's what the power is, is giving people metaphors and language that then they can use um, back with their coworkers and with their employees and, and customers. That's why you use that word, that word authenticity. I'm trying to remember the comedian that said it. He said something along the lines of, 
you know, the, the, the main thing you've got to learn is authenticity. Once you can fake that, you're onto it. <laughs> you're made. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I can't remember who, who, who said the quote. Maybe one of our listeners can let us know who, who actually said that quote. So let's talk about a time when you, you worked on one of your projects, on one of your creative projects, and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped. And, and more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? Yeah, so one that comes to mind, and I, I talk about this a lot, but it it's it was very uh, it's sort of burned in my memory, so that's why I think about it. But when I first started this with my wife, we we work on this company together, and you know, like any good entrepreneur or uh, artist or songwriter, you know, you you believe in yourself, and you're like, man, is I'm gonna hit the big time, right? And so we we uh, were gonna sell my artwork, and we made prints and greeting cards. And this is when I was doing the comic strip, Kim and Jason at the time. And we signed up for this uh, art show. This craft show is really what it was in Milwaukee here in Wisconsin. And it was, I don't know, it might have been like two or $300 in retrospect. It's not that much. But at the time, it was a big deal for us because we didn't have any money. We were just newly married. We we're living in this crappy apartment. And so we sat there for two days and we were right next to a guy who was selling illegal ripoffs of Garfield stuff. And then on the other side of us was this Pampered Chef booth, which is a, a company that sells kitchen um, utensils and, and whatnot. And they had like a they had a real cash register, James. And I mean, this thing was like just going nonstop. And then this other guy selling Garfield stuff, he's selling good stuff. And I've got my stuff and no one's buying anything. We had um, I think we sold four greeting cards over the course of two days for a grand total of seven dollars and 92 cents. And it was rough. I mean, it was really, really rough. Um, my my wife and I ended up going to a steakhouse and ordered steaks to drown our sorrows, which did not help our bottom line at all. Um, but we were just, you know, and there were there were so many times like that. And we'd come home and we'd have this, you know, we'd we'd be doubting and crying and wondering what we were were thinking. And I think if there's any lesson, I think it's the lesson that, you know, um, nothing comes easy. Nothing worthwhile comes easy. Like all of the overnight successes that you see in the media are really not overnight successes. They there there's usually a track record of five, 10, 20 years of silently working on the craft, silently trying things, failing, trying again. And I think when you want to do something that matters, it's sort of like the universe sits back and waits to see how bad you want it. Um, and that was sort of the lesson that for us, we were like, you know what? We felt so deeply that we were meant to be doing this. Now, maybe our strategy at the time wasn't good. Like we've been working on like the business model and marketing and all that stuff, improving ourselves. Like it's not like we were prideful and say people are idiots. They don't know any better. It was like, well, what, what could we do better? Um, but it was ultimately like we were burning bridges. We are not giving up no matter what. And we're just going to keep trying new things and, and, and until something works. And I think uh, that, that was the lesson is, is sort of that gut check of like, how bad do you want this? Are you in this or not? And and we decided from a very early, early on, we were we were in it for the long haul. You're 100. percent It's a bit like you mentioned at the top of the show, talking about the uh, talking about the Olympics earlier, and you see yeah. that so many time, time and time again. You know, um, and we're about to go into the Paralympics, which even is more about that as well. You know, people that have faced adversity, and you know, they've they've just said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to, I, I might, might change my tactics or my strategy, but you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to go for it, which is it's great. So that's a, that's a great. Um, story uh, there as well and, and what's you know what's some of the best advice that you've ever received about living a, a happy life living a, a creative life hmm um well that's a good question there's so much um a couple things i guess a couple things that come to mind is um uh this this may be teddy roosevelt that said this or i might just be completely making that up but it wasn't me but someone said a life of compare leads to a life of despair um that is one of my biggest challenges and i think is probably a challenge for any creative person is it's really easy to look at the people around you and compare yourself um 
to what they've accomplished. And a lot of times what we, what they, what we do is like the, the old saying is like, you're comparing your insides to someone else's outsides. Yeah. And that's, that's not really, uh, really fair. Um, I, uh, I think, yeah, the compare thing is a, is a big thing. And I think another one, this is from a, like a marketing perspective that I think people don't realize, especially entrepreneurs, but I liked how this was put. And the idea is around the, uh, is around the concept of niching or focusing on an, an audience. And this guy told me one time, he said, when you go fishing and you're trying to catch a certain type of fish, you put a certain type of bait on your, your hook that you know that fish will be attracted to. He said, that's what marketing is, is, is basically deciding how am I going to attract this specific type of a person. And then here's the part he said that like blew me away because most people are so afraid to, to niche because they're afraid, well, what about this person? And this person can use me and that company could use me. And you, you want to be all things to everyone, but it, it's just impractical. But he said this, he said, when a fish jumps into your boat, you can still have it for dinner. And I love that concept because that is how it works sometimes. You can focus all your marketing, your bait, if you will, on a certain type of thing. And every once in a while, something will come out of left field, jump in your boat, and you're like, hey, I didn't plan for that. I didn't try to get that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of it. And sometimes that can lead into a new niche or a new opportunity. And that has really helped me because – as an entrepreneur, as an artist who wants to to change the world, it's really easy to limit myself and say only this type of person is who I'm going after. But you only have so much time and and, and money, and you have you have to focus on one group at a time. And and so the permission of saying, well, if, if something else jumps in my boat, I can have it for dinner, was a really um, helpful insight for me to get my head around. Yeah, two great quotes. I, I love those. You know that. And I, we have a lot of uh, musicians that come on the show, and I think one of them said before when they came on, they said, "Kind of what you said in that fan, you know, a life of compare leads to a life of despair." And they were saying, you know, don't compare your front stage, your backstage, to someone else's front stage. Uh, and yeah. it's, just, it's the same this concept where it's so easy, especially when you see these big marketing campaigns go on, and you think, "Oh wow, you know, how, how are they doing that?" We're not seeing all the other stuff that's going on in the background. They're, they're the swans that look uh, look like everything's going great, but there's a lot of stuff going on underneath. Do you have any um, online resources or tools or, or, or apps like Evernote that you that you love and you often recommend? Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, Evernote. I mean, I've been using that for about three or four years, and it is like I I can't I love it I I love it so much just being able to capture ideas at any time wherever I'm at is so huge um oh, I'm trying to think I you know I I find like the I need to be more offline than anything um I get so sucked into Facebook and and some of those things that just going to an art museum or going to a live concert or going to a coffee shop to just be around people Sometimes that's where my best creativity comes from, which then when I have my phone and Evernote with me, I can like uh, I can I can capture those ideas or, or sometimes I'll just take pictures of things that inspire me and, and stuff like that. So um, to me, the challenge is trying to figure out how to how to keep the analog in my life, because everything is it's so easy to just to switch over to digital. And I think for me, the balance and the tension is what works. And I think uh, Austin Cleon uh, talks about this as well about you know almost having an analog setup and a digital <laughs> setup in his I think he has it in the studio and I mean there's so many if people go and watch go to jamestaylor.me and look through the, uh, some of my videos you'll see all the, the some of the studies about how different types of environments work well at different stages of the creative process not that one environment is going to work better but as you mentioned you know that coffee shop and there's there's lots of studies coming out now about certain points in the creative process just that low level noise that you're just mm-hmm. getting in the background and that in, obviously that interaction it, it just it is it's doing something in the brain there i could actually i'll say this now that you bring that up there is a is a small little uh, app that i use on my mac it's called coffeeativity um, it's like coffee activity, like productivity, coffee activity. And it's, that's all it is, is basically it plays a low level murmur as if you're in a, a coffee shop. And sometimes I'll do that. I'll be in my office where it's completely quiet and I'll just have this, um, little, um, app playing in the background that just makes it feel like I'm in a coffee shop and you can kind of hear people like having conversations and the door opening and that sort of thing. And that surprisingly, what has been a very amazing tool that I 
completely forget about uh, <laughs> until you mentioned it right now. Well, that's good. we'll definitely put that down. We had one of our previous guests on, on the show as well, uh, Rolf Potts, who writes the music for Dexter and a whole bunch of big t- movies. He has a similar thing. He uses long tones, and he actually had an, a whole album that he's just brought out of long tones because for him that that really helps him with his creativity. Oh, yeah. So yeah. let's, um, if you could recommend, we talk about apps there, and we'll put those links in the show notes. If you could recommend just one record or one song, for example, or album, and one book to our listeners what would they be hmm boy that's a that's a tough one because music i am so not musical but music is such a part of my life and uh our our uh soundtrack of our life you know um let me let me start with the book first i i would say Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm just going to say anything by Seth Godin. I'll, no, okay, I'll, I'll change. Seth Godin, I love Seth Godin, anything by him for sure. But the one, and this is probably, you've probably had people say this a million times on your show, but The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield okay. um, for me is like I if, I, if I read it once a year is a good thing because of um, how much, how, how valuable the insights are. And in a lot of ways, his metaphor of the resistance is very similar to my metaphor of adultitis. It's different in some ways, but I, I could plug in adultitis for the resistance and it would be, it would be the same, same concept. Um, just kind of a little bit different way of looking for it, looking at it. Um, I would say right, right now for me, this, the, the, the musician that is just kind of always in the background recently is Ed Sheeran. I just, something about him that I love the, the unique his unique sound and um he's got you know the stuff that just kind of gets you like fired up and then there's like the little quieter background stuff and that for me that's just for whatever reason i just have that on repeat all the time the last several months so um but yeah i can't i can't get enough of like singer songwriters um i'm always looking for for new ones and i love going to to live shows i feel like as i'm getting older the more the loud stuff, I'm, I'm just like, OK, I'm I'm too old for this. But the coffee shoppy, like singer songwriter vibe, like I love there. There's this really cool place in Nashville, Tennessee called the Bluebird Cafe that I've yeah, gone to a few it's times. It's really famous. And um, something like that, where it's just like a bunch of people sitting around playing songs. Love it. Can't I can't get enough of that. Awesome. We'll put all these in the show notes to people. If just people go and go to jamestail.me, type in Jason Kotecki, and then you're going to get the links to all these as well. So final question for you, Jason. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So all you have are the tools of your trade and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but you have no contacts. No one knows who you are. What would you do? How would you restart? Well, um, as unsexy as it sounds, I would I would probably keep doing what I'm doing now. So write, make art, and share it. Um, that's I think that's in, – in Austin Kleon talks about that, right, of like make the art, show your work, share it with the world. I think that's, that's the only real trick. Um, and then, you know, of course, I'd, I'd build an email list, start an email list. I'd, I'd blog, that sort of thing. But I think one of the things that has changed for me over the last several years has really been about when I uh, write our newsletter, when I'm posting something online, I'm taking that extra step to say, "Is does this matter? Like, so what? And to try to tell a story about my life, but then make sure that I'm giving them the, the, the moral, if you will. That was one of the lessons I've learned as a speaker is that you tell a story that maybe there's a metaphor and there's a lesson in it and you assume that people get the lesson. And I'm surprised to understand that they don't, that they actually need you oftentimes to give them, to apply it. How does this apply to your life? So if I were to like to tell the princess dress story and just leave it without saying you have a princess dress, your princess dress is the way that you present yourself to the world and it's sometimes very restricting like that i i when i started doing that i could almost almost literally see light bulbs going off in the audience of making that connection and so i think that's a big thing is is as an artist you have the stuff you want to share but you really have to focus on how does this matter to anyone else and I, i think being able to and not that you have to beat them over the head with an explanation either but um 
thinking is is there something of value in this to someone and taking that extra step to make that connection can make a big difference and so i think that's helped me a lot but overall just just make your thing and share it with people and just keep doing that and keep figuring out new ways to share it and that's i think that's the secret although like i said it's not very sexy um, because we're always looking for the the quick solution but that's that's the stuff that really adds up if you're consistent about it and as you were just saying, you're making sure that you're you're put, you're t- saying people what the learning point is from from something, especially when you're you're talking live as well. And it reminds me of an old philosophy teacher I had who said, "Always remember to finish off with the Miles Davis question: So what? <laughs> that that <laughs> yeah. was that's the, the yeah. thing I always had in the back of my head: the so what? So you go the so what? So what's the point? <laughs> so well, yeah. So Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. What's the best way for listeners to connect with you to learn more about the the, um, the escape adulthood uh, company, the events you've got going on. Yeah, well, if they go to escapeadulthood.com, they'll find everything about us, especially if you go to escapeadulthood.com slash insider. What we have is a, an adultitis fighter arsenal where we have a whole collection of um, tools and resources for people. Um, and it, it, it ranges from, you know, different what we call adultitis antidotes, things you can do to fight adultitis, real easy, cheap things, to how to how to throw an escape adulthood party. Um, there's a, a discussion guide for uh, my book about rules that don't exist. There's cover photos for Facebook, how to make mealtime more fun, just a ton of different things. Um, if you sign up to become a, an insider, which is that you can find that at escapeadulthood.com. But that's that's where we are online. And of course, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, it's all at Escape Adulthood. Great, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll put all these listeners, people will head over to jamestaylor.me uh, and just type in Jason Kateki. You're going to get all the links here as well. Thank you so much, Jason. I wish you all the best with the work that you and uh, Kim are doing. And I look forward to catching you live sometime. Thank you, James. It's been a real, real treat. Thanks. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.